All right, so um, at this point, we've had a pretty good amount of time, and by now we should have our thumbnails rocking the house. So we've got several of them uh, done here. Um, remember, in terms of like, like subject matter, uh, we want to create an environment, but also for entertainment. So there needs to be something like a payoff for the viewer. I would say that this one's actually pretty minimal. There's like nothing going on. Yeah, there's like some man-made structure here, but we need some sort of story, some sort of happening. Uh, and that's when we get into a little bit more story. We've got some sort of fancy, fantastic environment. Uh, we've got this dude. He doesn't look too happy. All right, so one of the things I might do if I were to detail this one up is add more subject matter to show why this guy's not so happy and what the whole significance of this world is. All right. Here, we've got some story <clears throat> going on. Um, obviously, underwater, we got a dude who's not from this environment, and he has just discovered some sort of an artificial uh, structure nestled in some canyon underwater. So there's some story potential there. We could use some more subject matter, like maybe some, uh, some more buildings just to flesh it out. All right. This one we got some story going on. We got this chained beast of some kind, and he's facing off against uh, some sort of a heroic looking <clears throat> character. Meanwhile, we got some uh, story driven elements, chains, which means this is an artificial environment. This guy is imprisoned uh, underground, so there's danger. It's not very safe. Um, thinking we could detail out quite a bit on this. There's a lot to work with. General rule of thumb is the more you got to work with, the easier time you've got. <clears throat> All right, this one's chaos to control using the leaf brush. Um, just trying to sculpt and mold forms and values to, to show a story. Um, the process you'll see today is exactly the same as what would be used for this one as well, regardless of how rough things are. Um, I'm going to skip this one because it's way too uh, raw. It's not refined or cleaned up at all. But kind of a sci-fi, techy kind of a spaceship looking environment. Got kind of a heavenly kind of an environment. Um, still again, not too much subject matter, a little incomplete. And lastly, we're going to attack this one. <clears throat> Just environment, again, no subject matter. We can put that in as we detail. Um, and just to define what subject matter is, again, it's the payoff for the image. Uh, it's the overall story that's being told in it. So, um, for example, if your image is about uh, like a party of orcs marching through the woods, uh, that would the orcs would be the subject matter, and the woods would just be the set, just like you're watching a show, um, and so on. So the question is, how do you know if you're ready to detail? You know that you're ready to detail if A, you've got most of your major forms pretty much laid out, B, you've got most of your major light, rough, rough lighting in. So, you know, like your one, two, three read, even if it's sloppy, block in values. And then, then C, again, if you've got enough things to work with in your image. And there's, you know, I could probably add a little more. There needs, I think some ruins would be cool. Um, maybe some footprints or, you know, whatever's going to be in this piece. I won't be able to finish all these out, render them up. The goal of this is to show you techniques. And um, so the first technique is how to upscale. And the purpose of upscaling is to take uh, an image that's small. And the reason why we're working small is because it's less RAM intensive. And we can cross an entire canvas in one quick stroke. And the brush moves very fluidly. Um, when we upscale, what we essentially do is we're like do doubling or tripling the resolution of the image making it about two or three times the size. And what we sacrifice is the ability to work large in exchange for the ability to zoom in and work small. Now, if I zoom in, you can notice we're pixelating, OK? Uh, we want to be big enough so that if I zoomed in, it wouldn't pixelate. That's the ultimate goal. <clears throat> I'll let you know one little secret. Those of you guys who've been drawing like your entire lives and shading and coloring and all that stuff, Detailing is no different than that. It's no different than that. Second funny little pointer is that whatever you are doing to work large, whatever you're doing with your brush, like to get these details and stuff in here, is the exact same thing that you would do, only zoomed in and focused on individual parts. That's it. So even your atmosphere pushes, even your light pushes, even your contrast and your planes, and all of that, it's the exact same thing. And sometimes your shading and hatching techniques come into play for textures. Um, 
Like for example, this is just stippling or hatching right here, really loose, suggestive, and so on. Finally, a lot of what you do when you paint is what's called indication. To indicate means to suggest a form. Suggesting a form means to <coughs> have it recognizable by your brain when you look at it, but not fully detailed out. So we could see, for example, these are, this could be rock or trees, but all they are are just loose little paint strokes. See it? So by suggesting, you're getting away with a lot more. Specifically like mechanical components, you don't have to paint every little gear. You need to paint the light that happens within those tiny little gears in like a robotic joint or arm or something. So suggestion and indication is, uh, <clears throat> is a lot of what we're gonna do. So there's two ways to do it, to upscale. One, either if you're gonna go for like a double size, just copy and then paste and then shift click and bring that thing up uh, to size. That's one way. <clears throat> and that's about, that's about probably a little more than double. But again, I want to uh, test and see how far I can zoom in and not pixelating yet. It's a little blurry. This is way better than what we had before. If I zoom into our original thumbnail. And I'm already on my screen, I'm getting like jagged stair step pixelation. Okay, so now already I've got <clears throat> um, twice the zoom depth to work with. Uh, I might go for a triple. So if you're gonna go for a triple, obviously it's not gonna fit on our page here. So we need to open this up in another file and upscale it that way. And so to do that, I'm just gonna make a new file. And we're what, like 11 inches wide. And let's see, we're about, uh, let's just say eight inches high. And you just drag and drop into the tab that you've opened and drop it in there, okay? Uh, and now to do a triple, what I'm gonna do is just crop it so that my canvas dimensions are to the size of my image and then go image, image size, and then I'm gonna triple everything I've got. So that means I'm gonna go 15 inches. Now over here, or on your computers, it might be on the left side, this little chain link icon means to constrain the proportions of your image. That means that if I change this to 15, the computer will apply the same adjustment to the height as well as with the width. So you don't have to do much calculation. So I'm gonna do seven by 15, that's a very big canvas. And now let's see how close we can zoom in before we pixelate. It's a little blurry because the computer is filling in information from a low res image. And look, that's how close we can get. So pretty good for detailing. Double or triple, it's up to you. <clears throat> and so let's get rocking. Alrighty. So step one is, I don't usually work on that many layers uh, with environments. The reason being is that uh, you don't really need it. You just kind of make a change and then flatten them out. Um, so let's get in here in detail. So step one is, just like your fruit exercise, where you had all those blocky um, value shapes, you then want to, all, all detailing is just cleaning, that's it. So you wanna have edge control, tight edge control of your forms. And what that means is clear definition in what these things are. So I'm gonna go in here and grab uh, my, um, my tool that I've got, my brush, my chalk brush, and I'm going to start to define what the edge of this form is and start to draw bark, tree bark. All right, let's follow the 80-20 rule. <clears throat> the 80-20 rule in painting means um, that 80% of the painting takes place in the first 20% of the time. So that means that if it took me, tw like if I had a whole block of time to create this painting, this is 20% of the time that it would take because pretty much the painting is finished um, at this stage. I'm gonna get some darker values here. I'm gonna add a branch and start painting in my lighting. So you just do a one, two, three, follow the same procedures for lighting that you've, that you've been taught. One, two, three, read. So we know light's coming from the left. This branch is going to catch some light. That's gonna be a one. You're gonna have a two and a three.
Maybe let's throw in some vines. And again, usually start with your mid-tone. And then go in and add your, um, your values after that. Just apply the one, two, three. It is a formula. It works. It's quick. And usually a one, two, three is all you got to do um, in order for it to read. If you have the time, which a lot of people don't in this industry, uh, remember concept art is really loose. It's because it's the ideas that we're trying to communicate and not, um, not the art. The art is just the way that we communicate. Um, as long as the idea works very well, you know, you can have a talented 3D designer, a talented set designer, take your work and fill in the gaps when they do their job after that. Oh, hit me, man. Yeah. I know that you're using like the size based on time pressure. Are you using opacity based on time pressure too? Negative. Okay. I'm actually manually controlling that. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, what I'm doing is like for this dark area, you see like I, I put a little shadow in right here. Um, so I took like a nine, I selected the black that was already in my canvas and I dropped that in there, boom. And then I go to like a five and then I just start to fade that out. Now remember, it's, it's painting. So what we're doing with paint is we're drawing light. You want to constantly go back to your design principles of what's called contrast. So I'm not even going to see these shadows if they're not in front of something that's light. So um, that's something that you want to factor in. Here's another fun tip. You don't have to stay at a weak opacity as you work. You could theoretically stay at like 100% and just color sample from with what you've already mixed. So like when I blended here, there's already some little shadows and I could just grab that little shadow and if I see an area where I could use that gray, stay at a high opacity and just block that in. And so you're just pushing and pulling. Remember, light values pull, dark values push. So if you want something to look like it's further away, like this bark sinks inward, then, um, then what you do is you, uh, you think, okay, so that's, that's parts of the tree that start to get away from the light because they go inward. You know, that's all you're thinking with push and pull. And so you're probably like, Mr. V, you don't have a photo reference open. How do you know what a tree looks like? And well, that goes back to visual library. Um, how many trees have you seen? Um, how strong is that library in the brain? And, and really, it's, uh, it's, it's just up to your own study. Um, you guys are probably better at doing deciduous trees than I am. I grew up in an area with conifers, you know, so um, that's uh, pine trees. So, uh, just do a little like hatching texture here to give this kind of a roughness. All right, so we got a dark branch, we've got a darkish tree, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lasso. I'm going to do the lasso technique for a value push. <clears throat> and remember to do a value push, you select a fuzzy brush. And I'm going to select this green and find a lighter version of that green. And then just lighten that area up a little, maybe a little less. All right, now I've just separated those trees. And so then I can go back to my chalk brush that I've got and refine this outside edge. Just edge control and clean up. So you're constantly looking at your values, constantly checking, um, checking stuff. You don't want to get so zoomed in that you're only working on one part of the painting. Um, let's see, lighten this up a little bit. Separate those forms. Maybe a little less. That's a little too strong. There we go. So now I've got my tree separated. And just like what you saw me do earlier, you see it's still very loose. It's very rough. You could get in there and detail the heck out of it. Um, you could make it smooth and not quite so choppy. All that involves, again, is just cleaning. So let's take these harsh strokes. And I'm going to take my <clears throat> brush down to like 50% and then make a mark. 
grab that new one, grab that new one, and just start to blend that together, just like you did with your fruit. See that? Just blending my value shapes. You can spend up to like dozens of hours on, on a painting. Um, but how would the class work if we spent that much time? We can't. So loose is probably the best you can get. I mean, if you've got the time at, at home, then go for it. Um, <clears throat> but I'm constantly changing my brush size, constantly shifting my opacity. I'm blending occasionally. Just making things less blocky, a little cleaner. Do you guys have any questions while you're watching this? I mean, Ben had a good one on technical stuff. It's really no different than still life. Still life skills. I'm gonna shrink my brush down so I can get a couple more details out. Let's get some bark. Some areas where the light might catch on the bark. Are you guys even seeing that on the screen that well? Okay, good. Okay, yeah, what I'm doing is, uh, it's just, you're, you're indicating. So like for bark, like I'm putting like parallel lines sort of and I'm breaking them kind of like that. Uh, it, it's just all indication, it's, it's just details. So I'm doing it in stages. So I've got little light highlights. Um, last once you got a good foundation. I think these trees are a little bit too green. So here's another thing that you can do in production. Grab that lasso tool. And um, you could do uh, subtle color changes. Like if you want to desaturate and shift the colors a little bit to warm them up or cool them down. That's one thing you could do. Uh, you can also go to image adjustments, color balance, and that does the same thing as that color shift. It just allows you to manually uh, adjust the colors. Here's another fun thing to do is I like to use the dodge and the burn tool sometimes for value. And so like I might use the dodge, dodge brush very lightly. Now here's the thing though, I just did that on the layer of the paint, <clears throat> the painting. Now I can't go back and change anything. <laughs> so one of the other ways you can do the exact same thing is to create a new layer, set that new layer to color dodge, and then get like a soft brush that's the color of your light. And then go in there and lightly, lightly brush in some values, like so. And then we can do, uh, let's find color burn and let's do the, oh shoot, probably have to do that in a new layer. <laughs> All right, do color burn. And you could add um, shadows that way. So see, I've got, I've still got white, whitish selected, and you can lightly brush in your shadows. Uh, if that effect is too loud, it's on its own layer. So let's get an eraser out and just fade that, erase parts of that layer away. Now here's one other cool thing, you guys. It's on its own layer, which means we can adjust the color. If you want that light to be more yellow, just shift it towards the yellow spectrum. You can totally change that. You can play with the saturation, all of the above. I didn't have pressure sensitivity on that, so not much to work with. So, all right, let's add a couple more details and move right along. Let's give you guys a, a time frame to work within. <clears throat> so what we're going to do, <clears throat> this is pretty genero, just to teach you the skills. Later, we're going to create an environment uh, strictly from the world that you created with your character designs. And, and what that means is uh, <clears throat> you'll have some continuity in the things that you've, you've worked on so far. Kind of like how in college you have what's called like a set theme with your work. So for example, in college, <clears throat> my theme was uh, like guinea pig robots and stuff, really silly stuff. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, 
So, uh, so I was stuck to that theme. The year before that, my theme was splattering insects. So I was trying to get down how the watercolor palette worked, how the tools work. And so I stayed within that theme so that I could uh, grow and learn. And so there's consistency in the things that I painted. So with you guys, this will be kind of a generic environment. And your character designs are going to be where your next assignment's going to come from. We're going to paint an actual shot from the world that, um, that you guys have designed. What do you guys think of that? Does that sound kind of fun? It's like, it's like Ben, that Titan that you crafted. We're going to see more from that world. <laughs> I think because really the environment was supposed to be space, but Clean up my edge. <clears throat> so to clean up my edge of my tree here, I'm selecting the shadow. And you just kind of keep going to town. Some people like to stay zoomed out and bounce around. Um, here, let's do a little something with the light. Have some light on the ground, that'd be cool. Let's do that. <clears throat> Color dodge layer. And launch it. Oh yeah, set it to color dodge first. Jeez, for that. No! So with color dodge, you're going to get more of an effect um, in areas where there are like neutral tones, it looks like. See how the brown turned into like more of a yellowish, rich, warm color versus like the washed out brown didn't do much. It just kind of went white. So usually your color dodge, what I found that works is color dodge works great once you've got more paint on the canvas. And I just want to talk really quickly about what grip is on a canvas. Grip is the amount of information that's on there. Um, and so what that means is if there's a canvas where it's mostly like smooth values like this and not much happening, that doesn't give the painter much to work with. Whereas over here, there's all these little tiny strokes and values and we can, our mind can pick out little darks and lights that we can then manipulate to turn into like branches or little nooks and crannies and that kind of stuff. Uh, that's what grip is. All right, so when there's less happening on the canvas, it's, a, it's harder for you. So you want to actually have quite a bit uh, going on in there before you hit the dodge and the burn. So I'm going to get my leaf tool and let's just throw in some um, some trees. Some Oh shoot, too big. Alright, so you're probably thinking, okay, this looks weird. It doesn't look it looks kind of automatic. Well, you're right, but we're suggesting. So ultimately, I don't want the piece to look like it's been used with the leaf brush. So like, for example, this leaf that's sitting out all by itself, I'm going to paint that out, but I'm just blocking in some, some roughness so that I can have something to work with at a later time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you've got your sound layer there. Yep. Um, would it be possible to make the leaf layer on a different layer? Like, make the leaf layer itself, and then when you're done, like, fixing it and stuff, you can uh, merge it? Oh, heck yeah, man. Like, I should have done the leaf layer on its own layer. Now I can go in and, uh, with my brush, start to roughly indicate values here. 
so it doesn't look like a bunch of leaves. Like here, I'm going to leave all this. That, that worked pretty well. Here, it's flying apart and just looks kind of odd. Probably going to turn this into uh, some vines. <laughs> we need way more stuff. Like jungles are so tangled. They're like a tangled mass of, uh, of, of activity here. So I'm going to throw a big old rock. in this area. And let's bring some foliage up over this rock. One thing I'm digging, I like the contrast in it, but not in all the areas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lap. This feels a little flat to me. Um, that's, that's a risk when you're working large. If you zoom in, most of your stuff might start to flatten. I'm just going to lasso that out, give it a levels adjust. There we go. That's another thing that you can do. Make adjustments as you go in your work. And you see why you don't really see details that much in tutorials? Uh, mainly because it's, it's boring. The painting's already pretty much happened. Uh, a lot of detail work is just highlights, um, indicating textures, cleaning edges, making the piece kind of uh, gel together, if that makes sense. You know? So like, I've got to give a reason why these trees aren't standing up vertically. That, that doesn't make any sense. You know? So these are things that you do when you're in the detailing stage. That's just to um, you know, rough it in. Maybe there's a rock slide. So I'm going to take this rock. I make another one. See that? See that's why digital is so so fast. You can um, you can do so much more with with digital. Like you can't copy and paste, <laughs> you know, in, in traditional uh, traditional work. So I'm gonna put another another rock over here. Any other questions, you guys? Feel free to just fire away. So this is like the big picture at the bottom, right? Yes, this will be the big one that you've got. Um, you've, you've, you've reserved space in your in your piece for a larger um, a larger image. And my Wacom tablet like just went kaput, so. Okay, there we go. We're back in business. For some reason, my Wacom tablet decided to quit working. Do <laughs> you guys ever have that happen? Yeah. Yeah. What happens? All the time. That's a pain in the butt. So I think it's a good time to start painting some subject matter in. Um, I'm going to throw some ruins into this piece. So let's make it like. I really like what's going on here with these rocks. Uh, maybe we'll make it look like this is an old, ancient, uh, man-made area um, that we could. Let's see, let's darken. There we go. Let's give it some life. It's way too monochromatic here. So I'm going to, we've got mostly cool colors. I'm going to warm it up with some yellows before we do anything else. Uh, maybe like some flowers of some kind. Um, like maybe in this area where the sunlight shines, we've got more. Um, oh, dude, mushrooms. Yes. Good idea. Good idea. Do it. Let's do like a big old shri Hey, you know, that'd be a really cool thing to make this more of a fantasy environment. Put some enlarged, uh, you know, like mushrooms that live in this area. But uh, how long you guys think we've been working on this already? Like, what, 20, 
15, 20? 20 minutes. Okay, so do you see how much has happened in 20 minutes? Do you see how it's still loose? All right, so I was rushing. Okay, imagine though, just basically you're doing the same thing at this depth that you did at this depth. And you keep plugging along, and then a little later, all right, we're going to do one more thing, and then I'm going to set you loose. And that one more thing is once you get your value shapes placed and most of your, your detail, oh, let's put some moss in here. Moss growing on these rocks. That'd be cool. Yeah, I play with the. Uh, and play with your brushes. You might find a scat, like a scattery kind of a brush in here that works great for moss. Like, let's try this. Yeah, that works for moss. That's cool. It's a little CG looking, but hey, it works. Oh. All right, let's clean up our edge. That looks way too artificial. Yo! You bet. You bet, lady. Okay, so let's say we're ready for some textures. You know you're ready for te some textures when it's time, uh, when you've got all your values in place and that everything's pretty much ready to go. Um, you don't want to rely on textures for your work, otherwise it becomes what's called a photo collage. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to find some rough rock and just some rough uh, tree type textures, lay them in there, and then I'm even going to paint, paint a little more after that, after the textures are laid in. And uh, let's see what we can find. So um, let's search for, well, I don't know, like jungle tree. Uh, here we go. Really loving this. And as a matter of fact, this gives me inspiration for more of the designs. So uh, like maybe if I were to continue designing, I'd throw so much moss hanging on the branches that it's like drooping off on the bottom. That might be a fun thing to try. Um, and also tangled roots. Oh gosh, love to add that in. Rarely do you have a jungle floor that you could just walk on like a path. Uh, but what I'm looking for right now is like, oh, here we go. Yeah, that could work. Drop that in there. No. That's called the skew tool. So remember, before you throw a texture in, take it black and white. Levels adjusted a bit to bring out the values. You know, you can even put color in there. I mean, it's not a hard, fast rule uh, because we're going to be going like probably to multiply or, well, no, not multiply, soft light or overlay. Something that's uh, very just there to help us out. Thank you. Thank you. You know, textures, they don't take too long. You know, you're just copying and pasting, duplicating, taking portions of a texture and just repeating it. Um, you don't want to make it look like it's been texture stamped, though. You, know, you want to be kind of subtle, you know. Um,
Let's, let's see what that texture looks like in an area that we have not detailed yet. It helps, but you got these big ugly blotches. <laughs> you know, you see the texture doesn't work unless you've blended your value shapes together and worked on it quite a bit, you know? And there, there's a lot of room for work here. I mean, you can see how loose this still is. Um, so uh, let me get some rock really quick. All right, let's do rocks. No, oh, this could work. No. No. Aha! That's what I'm looking for. Nice. So you got in your mind, like, what kind of rock is it? I envisioned a smoother one with, like, a smooth rock with a uh, rough texture on the outside, you know? So um, let's, let's do it without making it go black and white and see what happens. It's a fuzzy rock. Uh, one thing you want to worry about is photo density. Photo density. The amount of information per pixel in this photograph is very, very high versus the amount of information per pixel here in my painting is very, very low. All right, so um, probably want to factor that in when um, applying your textures. Yeah, so that doesn't look so hot. We could, we could grab that. That could work. Yeah, we could, yeah, definitely want to turn the opacity down. You got that right, lady. And also what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly erase portions of the texture that are hit in direct light. Um, it gave it some life. Anyway, so let's say you run into an area where your textures are way too photo dense. Uh, you could blur your textures a little. Give it a Gaussian blur. Very subtle though. We're talking like like here's the texture before, after, blurred a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's one thing you could do. You know, here's our rock. It needs a lot more detail work. So, what do you do after your textures? Well, this is what you do when you're happy with them. Um, mash it all down. And now I'm just going to use my lasso tool, protect an edge, and let's just brush in some darker values. Let's do the same thing with uh, some lights. Grab the color that you want. Oh, hey, guess what? Let's do this. Let's color dodge. Let's do a color dodge layer. I'll set that to pressure sensitivity so I got a little bit more manipulation ability here. That's a shadow. We don't want to. We don't want to lose that. So this guy. Um, all right. Let's see what we got. We got cinders and sparks in the foreground. You know, those are little details that you put in. All that is uh, is you, uh, just a quick little blob, and you set motion blur on it. It's a motion blur. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you what a film grain effect is. And what that is, is when your eyes, the way your eyes work, um, your eyes will uh, take a time to adjust and you'll see kind of a graininess that happens. And also you see that a little bit in our cameras. Uh, so it's a cinematic effect is what it is. And so there's really no vignette on this. So I'm going to add a vignette. Here's how you do it. You duplicate the layer. You levels adjust or darken the layer quite a bit. So you got one copy that's dark, one that's light. And then what you do is you get your, like if you want to say a, a round vignette, okay, you get your elliptical marquee tool and you set feathering pretty high. Feather means it makes the edges of your selections fuzzy. 
So I'm going to go in here and just uh, kind of, eh. There you go. Yeah, that, that works. And you just delete. You cut a hole in that sucker. And you see how now we've got like this darkened edge that kind of frames the piece. Uh, if you want more of a gradual transition and not such an abrupt, hard, like, oh, look, there's a big spotlight oval in the middle of it, then have your feathering higher. And you can also play with uh, opacity. It's way better than painting black in there because you're using the original image to get that dark rim. Um, so that really works. All right, let's do a cinematic kind of visual photo noise effect. So I'm just going to duplicate this little dude. All right. Um, stick him on top of the vignette, see how that works. And what you do is with your copy of your image, you go to filter. Filters are for special effects. You go to noise, add noise. All right, so how much do you add? A lot. It just kind of varies per piece. Like not much noise, doesn't do much. All right, so I'm going to add a ton of it. Then I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to blur the noise just a little bit. So filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And here's a nice zoom in of it. Here's no blur. Here's a little bit. You want to still see the noise, OK? So that's just half a pixel. I'm going to say OK. Then I'm going to blend it. So I'm going to take my layer blending mode. And let's try overlay. Let's try soft light. Soft light, a little more pleasing effect. And if we zoom in, we got this really ugly sand sandbox grain over everything. Um, and so the next step is take your opacity down. We want just, uh, just a, a rough texture to it. And so if it compromises the detail work in your piece, then you've done too much. Um, and so it's a very subtle effect that you do. OK, depth of field, how do you do that? Again, you're seeing the pattern. Duplicate your, your image, your piece. And whatever that is, uh, blur the crud out of it. That's a technical term. So I'm going to Gaussian blur. And we're really going to jack it way up there to the point where, on my screen, it's like I can still see my forms, but I can't see uh, what's what, per se. All right. And now, what you do is things that you want in focus, you erase that blur layer. So I'm going to get a soft edged eraser and start erasing the blur out. So if I want his arm partially in focus, I could take my eraser down to 50% opacity and then erase 50% of the blur. You see what I mean? What you don't want is this Vaseline effect where it looks like you got a smudge on your lens. You do want to have crisp edges if you're going to do um, a blur like this. So like I'm going to shrink my brush down so I have precision down here on these edges. And oops, if you go past it, just undo. I think I could have added that. It would have would have looked really cool. But let's uh, let I'm going to blur the foreground figure and I'm going to leave his cape. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to sharpen the foreground figure and let's leave his cape um, blurry and let's see what happens. It actually sounds kind of cool. It might have a really neat cinematic look. Any other questions, you guys? Ben, you had a lot of good ones, man. I still don't understand the purpose of the noise, though. Oh, it's a. Uh, I get that it's there for like. Cinematic texture. Yeah, right. I just don't understand how it affects the photo. So if you're going to, um, if you're going to have areas of your piece that are in high and low photo density, 
meaning. Let's say you've got areas uh, like let's go back to Fozzie Bear that really messed up. Um, Yeah, I'll pull that up on the screen here just to show you. Some of the elements in that piece were of a low photo density and some were of a high photo density. So they stood out. They didn't gel together. They didn't look as if they belonged in the same image. And so that film grain effect gives the same texture to everything in the piece and makes for, uh, it, it makes kind of a status quo of the photo density of your elements. It gives the same texture flavor to everything. Oh, I got it. And it kind of helps things gel. A blur does that as well, but you can easily do a blur and make people have a headache in the middle of the door. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, so that's, that's uh, those are some techniques for landscaping. Um, Detailing is really nothing that I haven't seen you guys do already. You know? um, here's what, let's, let's give ourselves a timetable to work with it. Um, we were at a rate of about two thumbnails per class. Let's spend a total of four days on the upscale version. That's about more than four hours. It's like five hours, five and a half <coughs> um, on that bad boy. Prepare to have kind of a loose -ish, loose image. Um, and then um, that's like for this exercise. The exercise after this, we're going to then take what we've learned from this process, and you guys get to concept out and create uh, a world image of your a scene that would be in the movie from your character's world. Um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun. So, um, I don't know why. I'm just doing this here. Questions before we begin? Yes? For the upscale thumbnail, should we take one of our previous thumbnails and start doing the entire Previous. Okay. Yep. We want to take an example in that piece we have all there. So here's what it looked like before. After. Oh, one last thing. One last thing. Almost forgot. You guys saw that I took um, this landscape sketch and I put it into um, a new file. So let's imagine we're done now because this is humongo. Okay, this is like gigantic. So when you're done, you push all your layers together. Let's grab this bad boy. And I'm going to drag and drop him into my original. Oh yeah, look how huge he is. So we're going to transform. I'm going to shift clip. And see what this does is all that detail that we just worked on is now going to get slightly compressed. Okay. There's no roller from that house. Look down, dang it. Okay, well, whatever. And I'm just going to slot this little dude. 